How are we doing today? Good. Awesome. We got the spiritual people here, right? Because everyone else is out watching the game. Hey, man. I got one. There you go. Um, so last week, I, uh, my wife works sometimes on Sundays, and uh, I, uh, I, so I had, the son, I had my son to myself coming to, to church, and uh, it just, it, the morning didn't go off well, and so I looked really tired. Um, if you guys remember, like, months ago when I preached, I said there's going to be a rule. You no longer say you look tired to people when you first see them. You say, I'm glad to see you. Some of you guys have been breaking that rule, especially with me, um, which I don't appreciate because sometimes I look tired when I get full night's rest, like last week, but things were just crazy getting out of the house. Um, and other mornings, like this morning, I didn't get as much sleep because at three in the morning, my son decided, hey, this is a good time to cry. Um, and I look awake because I comb my hair. Um, And last week, I dropped Haddon off at the nursery, and Tom Lumsden looks at me and goes, does he have another sock? (laughs) I looked at his feet and said, nope. (laughs) I wore sandals that day, so we had one sock between the four feet of the Sherson boys. Um, But we made it, right? A little late. It happens. Uh, My my, my wife was, you know, not working today, so we were able to, you know, get here, socks on every foot, and I was able to brush my hair, so praise the Lord. (laughs) Uh, Let's pray as we get started. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. I pray that you would give us new insights into who you are and what you are up to through these stories. Father, uh, help us to make much of you. Speak through me. Um, Use this passage to change us, to change our hearts for you. Pray ultimately for the glory of your name, for the good of your church, and for the expansion of your kingdom throughout the world. And I pray all this in your son's name and by the Spirit's power. Amen. So our son, who I was just telling you about, he's uh, getting close to five months old now. Uh, His name's Haddon. And my wife and I have disagreed on the correct nickname for Haddon. Uh, So my wife, since before he was born, started calling him Haddon Boy. Uh, And that was her nickname for the kid, and um, she's been pushing it. And then I, on the other hand, uh, have been pushing for Spurgy to be the nickname. Now, you guys are like, what is Spurgy? Um, so we named him after Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who's one of my favorite preachers and writers. Um, uh, and Charles just seemed too formal. And if we named him Spurgeon Sherson, he'd never be able to say his name. Um, so I've been pushing Spurgy as the nickname. But the, the problem is neither of those nicknames actually capture who he is. Um, the the more appropriate nickname would be Game Changer or Redefiner because in the last five months, the majority of what I define life as and what is good in that has changed. And so, I mean, a a good day is now defined differently. Is is that me making the noise? Do I need to move this way? Hey, look at that. I'll preach from over here. Um... (laughs) We'll figure it out as we go. So, hey, awesome. I don't know how it works. So just, just walk around, see what happens. Um, because everything has changed. A good day has changed. The definition of a relaxing afternoon has changed. The definition of a good night's sleep has changed. Uh, the definition of an acceptable amount of poop on my hand has changed. Uh, that, that changed this week. Like, it's crazy. And, and even definitions of things like success and family have changed in the past few weeks and months because of him. He has changed my definitions and he has changed my expectations. And that is what Christ has done as well. And in this Jesus encounter that we're going to see, we're going to find that Jesus doesn't always meet the expectations and definitions that people place on him. We'll be in Matthew 11 this morning. So if you have your Bibles or you have it on your phone, go ahead and pull that out. The words will be on the screen as well. We'll be in Matthew 11. We're going to see how John the Baptist and some of the other cities that Jesus ministered in had differing expectations and definitions of the Messiah. Matthew 11, 1 through 6. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. You're welcome to read from whatever you brought or read along on the screen. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to preach and teach in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word 
by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This is a a bit of a strange section in the book of Matthew. There's two sections in front of it of teaching and then of miracles. And then in chapter 13 begins what is called the third discourse of Matthew. And sort of in this in-between of chapters 10 through 12, we have uh, different stories of how people respond to the Messiah. And that's chiefly what we're going to look at today is how do people respond and what expectations do they place on the Messiah? And the first is John the Baptist, who asks a question. He says in verse 4, through his messengers, he's in prison, he sends his messengers, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? It's a great question of expectation here. John the Baptist has a specific expectation of who the Messiah would be and what the Christ would do. So Christ isn't Jesus' last name, it's a term given to him. And so that term has expectations that comes with it. Now, it's it's also a kind of a strange question for Jesus to question whether, for John to question whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. Because if you remember your stories well, in John chapter 1, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming to him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How did he know it then and miss it now? What has changed? Why is he asking this question? Well, one thing we know is that he is in prison. He's in prison for being this precursor, this prophet who came and told people to repent. He's in prison with, underneath the authority of Herod, Herod Antipas. And John the Baptist believed that the Messiah of Isaiah 61 would come and set the captives free. And it is in that context where he is looking for the Messiah to come and fulfill his expectation, which is for him to be free of prison, that he asks this question, are you the one or should we look for another? Because if you're the one, then why is John still in prison? That doesn't add up. He's doing this stuff for you, Jesus, and now he's in prison. You're supposed to set the captives free. Are you the one or not? And Jesus' response shows what Jesus thinks of these expectations in verse 4 and following. Jesus answered, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. The first part there, go and tell them what, go and tell him what you hear and see. This is Matthew crafting this story about Jesus to, for a very specific, this line refers exactly back to the last like six chapters of Matthew. Chapters 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. That's a lot of preaching. Go and tell them what you heard. And then following that is a bunch of miracles. Go and tell them what you've seen. Like, if you've paid attention through the story this far, you know that Jesus is the Messiah. Go and tell John that. And then he quotes Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 in this list where dead are raised, lepers are healed, lame walk good news is preached, but he leaves out one line from Isaiah 61. Do you know what it is? Set the captives free. So what's going on here? Jesus says, yes, I am the one, not explicitly, but implicitly in his words, I've preached the gospel, I have preached the kingdom, I have healed, I am the Messiah, and I have done what Isaiah has said except for he hasn't set the captives free. And that's because it is on his timing that the expectations of the Messiah are met, not on John's and not on ours. And so Jesus is saying, yes, I'm the one. I have done everything and I will do everything that it is said that I will do. 
And he closes it with a beatitude that we don't usually quote when we quote beatitudes. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Verse 6 is a beatitude. It starts with a blessing and it has a, a description of a blessed or a happy person. John missed the Messiah in this moment and was offended by the Messiah in this moment because his expectations and his convenience are not being met. It was not convenient for John the Baptist to be in prison. And John knows what happens when he's in prison. He knows what's lying ahead of him. And in a few chapters, we'll see it in Matthew that he will be beheaded for what he has taught and said and called the nation of Israel to do. And that's not supposed to happen if the Messiah is here was exactly what John was saying. This isn't convenient. This isn't what I expected. What do we do when our expectations and our conveniences aren't met by Christ? Do you and I care more about Christ or about our preference? Do we care more about the gospel or our expectations? Do we care more about the kingdom or our convenience? It wasn't convenient for John to be in prison. I, I believe one of the biggest idols in our world today is convenience. Unlike any age before us, information, entertainment, connection is at the press of a button. It is at our fingertips. It is in my pocket now while I'm preaching. I didn't even leave it in my office. That's how dependent we are on it, right? You can pull up Netflix. You can get on Facebook. Some of you might be on Facebook right now instead of your Bible app. Or check in your fantasy football roster to make sure they're doing well. I know that some of you have been on Facebook while I've been preaching before because people have posted to my wall while I'm preaching on Facebook. It has a time signature. <laughs> like, we have convenience at the push of a button. And when something is not convenient for us, it drives us crazy. And it, it changes who we are. It changes the way we interact with people. We don't care about the gospel most because we care about our convenience more. We don't care about others more than ourselves because it's more convenient to connect with the people on Facebook than the people in front of our face. I, I had the opportunity uh, two and a half years ago to go to the Masters Golf Tournament. Uh, there was a guy at our church who had, uh, he was a patron, so he had tickets every single year. And uh, we, had, we had struck up a conversation at a Nashville Roller Girls uh, match. Yeah, I went to Roller Derby. It's okay. Um, and uh, he's like, yeah, I, I go every year. I'm a patron. He goes, but I never go on Thursdays or Sundays. So if you ever want to go, let me know. I was like, yes, yes, I want to go. Um, and a couple weeks later at church, he goes, so do you prefer Thursday or Sunday? I was like, you know, whatever works best for you. Because this is like bucket list material, going to the Masters Golf Tournament. And so me and my best friend go to the tournament and uh, he gives us a bunch of rules, like you have to do these things and you can't do these things because they kick you out for life and the person who gave you the ticket. Um, and one of the things is you do not bring any electronics into the Masters Golf Tournament. They won't let you through security, so just leave it in the car. And so my friend and I, who are so used to being on our iPhones, whether it's you know, in church or at a stoplight that takes too long or there's a pause while waiting for someone to meet you for lunch, it's just easy to pull out the phone and start checking things. We didn't have our phones for the better part of 12 hours. And the craziest thing happened. We started having conversations with people around us that we had never met before. Because our convenience had been taken away. Last night, I, I found out that uh, you can actually buy, uh, they're called buttons on Amazon. And it's not a button like on the shirt. It's a button, button that you push, and it's, it has a brand picture on it. So you can get uh, like a glad one where you push a button, and they're going to send you trash bags. Or you can get a Windex one. And as soon as you're at a Windex, you push the button, and they send you more Windex. Um, I found it because they have a Gerber uh, baby formula button. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I don't have to go to the store anymore. I just push the button, they charge it to the card, and they ship it. It's amazing. Like, that's how convenient life has become for us. And that changes the way we live life, and it changes our expectations in every area of our life, including the church. And what happens in the church is when something isn't convenient for us, if it makes us change how we do church, or it makes us change our favorite program or our favorite song, we don't like it, and we dig our heels in because it's not convenient. 
It doesn't fit our expectations of church. And now, more than ever, for Grace Community Church is a time for us to set aside golden calves of convenience and be willing to take whatever changes come because Jesse's coming in like three weeks and things are going to change when he gets here because he's different than Todd and anyone else who's been here before. And that's just Christ working through him to change the church to what Christ wants the church to be here in Auburn, Washington. And we need to be on board with that. And so, Jesse, if you're watching, when you get here, we are on board for the changes that you're going to bring. We're going to set aside convenience as long as it doesn't deal with student ministry. I wrote that last part as a joke last night, and then I realized this morning that it was a little bit serious because I, I too, have this idol of convenience. Like, yeah, change whatever you want, Jesse. Just, just don't mess with student ministry because I like what I'm doing. But the, there, it, the, in that, I felt my heart... Be, being hesitant against change and against whatever direction Christ takes this church because it might not be convenient for the way I like my week to go as it comes to work. And we can miss Christ and the gospel and the church because we are playing church according to our expectations, and that is not what Christ has called us to do. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Let's not be offended when Christ calls us to change and calls the church to look differently for a new season. Let's not miss Christ the way that John the Baptist did in this moment. What's interesting is, as, as you continue in the passage, John the Baptist is then encouraged and promoted by Jesus. He is, in, in verses 7 through 19, we're not going to read them, but Jesus makes it clear that John is not condemned for this doubting, for his expectations. In verse 10, he affirms John as the precursor from Malachi 3.1, although it's interesting that he changes the, when he quotes Malachi 3.1, he changes the pronoun from me to you when he affirms John the Baptist being the messenger of the Yahweh coming. And what that means is that the Yahweh who came is Jesus. So in his affirming of John the Baptist as the forerunner, he is saying that he is the Messiah. Later on in verse 14, he will affirm John the Baptist as Elijah of Malachi chapter 4. And he confirms what we already know is clear, and that is that John is the precursor of the Messiah. He affirms John and all he has done. And in verse 18 and 19, the, the Pharisees have a problem with both of these guys. First John, he didn't eat and drink. He was a weird guy who sat in the desert and lived eating locusts and didn't eat grapes or touch dead things because he took a vow. And so they said he was demon-possessed. And then Jesus came along and he ate and drank with sinners. And so they called him a drunkard and a glutton. It's like, what do you want, Pharisees? Pick one or the other here. But both are condemned because neither served the Pharisees' purpose. The Pharisees missed Jesus and John the Baptist in a different way. They didn't miss because it wasn't their expectation they missed because they weren't following the rules that the Pharisees had put in place. The Pharisees were doing exactly what Jesus said would happen in verse 12, that, that some would come and do violence, or literally to lay hold of the gospel. The wicked will always try to plunder the gospel and Christ for their own purposes. But as we continue in Matthew 11, we will see that the gospel cannot be bent or laid hold of for one's own purposes because of who Jesus is. The passage does not leave room for Jesus to be just a moral teacher or someone who shows you one way to God. It doesn't leave room for him to be a good teacher because what he says makes it clear that he, the authority of Jesus' words are not one of a teacher but of one who is Lord. In 20 through 30, we will see that Jesus, the other way to miss Jesus, we will also see perhaps the clearest presentation of the gospel by Jesus. It will come in three words. First, a word of, of announcement of pending destruction, waiting for those who don't repent. Second, a word of revelation, that all revelation and disclosure of salvation comes through Christ. Third, a word of invitation to come to Jesus and find spiritual and eternal rest. So let's keep reading in the passage, verses 20 through 24. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. 
Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on Sodom on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Jesus is not quite the felt board Jesus that we remember from children's church here. Like, he is getting kind of mean towards these cities. Jesus spent a good deal of his time in these cities, preaching in these and other towns, and doing most of his mighty works and healings there. The people were glad to listen to Jesus. They were delighted that he healed so many people, and they really liked having their stomachs fed by the sea that day when he multiplied the food. Jesus was immensely popular in the first parts of his ministry. Comparing their destiny to Tyre and Sidon would not be good for these cities. Tyre and Sidon were Phoenician cities. So this is north of Israel along the Mediterranean Sea. You would find Tyre and Sidon. These were cities of idolaters, of Baal worshipers. And we know what God thinks about worshiping another. And it's going to be better for them than for Chorazin and Bethsaida, where Jesus did the miracles because they saw Christ, they heard him, they saw who he was, and they did not repent. Comparing Capernaum's destiny to that of Sodom is all the more powerful, as Sodom was a Canaanite city destroyed in Genesis 18 for its wickedness. Capernaum is the city where Peter and many of the disciples came from. It was the hub of Jesus' ministry. He taught numerous times there on the shore of Galilee in the, in the synagogue there as well. So why is Jesus denouncing the people now? Because they would not repent. He had not been doing miracles to meet physical needs alone, and he wasn't preaching for political purposes He had been ministering among them to bring them to salvation, and that begins with repentance. People like the idea of religion if it gives them what they want or if it makes them feel comfortable, but a call to repentance is different. And so what we see here in these cities is that they loved having Jesus around until it called for repentance. People who believe they have truth will not be open to more revelation. People who are self-righteous don't think they need to repent. The cities didn't repent because they thought they were good. They thought they were righteous because they followed the rules and Jesus was a nice teacher and a guy who healed some people. So they liked him until he started calling them to repent. And this is the second way that we can miss Christ. The first is through expectation. The second is through obligation. They missed the way that the Pharisees missed Jesus, and that is through the law and through rules. Let's keep reading, verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things you have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." You guys know that, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden verse, don't you? How many of you knew that came right after all this woes and all this blessed is the one who is not offended? Do you guys quote that part as you get to quoting, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden? Or you just skip ahead? We just skip ahead, right? Because it's, no one wants to quote woe to you, Chorazine, because Chorazine's hard to say and it's kind of mean. 
We skip ahead because that's the part that we really like. But that part, divorced from the rest of this passage, loses the fullness of its meaning. Here in 25 through 27, we have a word of revelation, that all revelation as it comes to salvation comes through Jesus Christ and is revealed to those who will follow him. People in their wisdom cannot find God. It must come from revelation. And people cannot please God without faith. Conventional wisdom cannot, can lead us to miss Christ and the gospel just as John did. Jesus is the one who reveals himself to those who will come to him, those who will be saved. This is not the language of a good teacher, but of God. And we don't have time to get into all the theology that this verse has. But what is clear is that the wise and understanding will miss Christ because of the simplicity and the offensiveness of the message. And there are two ways to miss Jesus that I want to point out here. The first is the way that John missed. This is missing because of expectations and definitions of who God is and how the world ought to be. And so the best word that I can use to describe this way of missing God is relativism. And so what happens in relativism is we say, they will say things like this. What is true for you is true for you and what is true for me is true for me. Each person has their own truth, and you can't tell me that I am wrong. They believe that everyone needs to determine what is right and wrong for themselves. And they deny absolute truth, claiming each person can have their own truth, unless that truth becomes inconvenient for them. On the surface, they're more happy and tolerant than moralists. They may even talk about God's love, but they do not believe in sin which means that God's love costs nothing because it requires no sacrifice. I personally, between the two ways of missing Christ, am more likely to fall into this camp. And here's how it looks like practically for me. I typically don't do things that I'm bad at. Like, legitimately. Um, People think I'm really good at every game that exists because they've never seen me throw a football. I am terrible at throwing a football but I'm really good at ping pong and ultimate and foosball and things like that. So people think I'm good at all these games. And my wife, despite the fact that she knows that I'm not good at everything, can even forget about this too. Um, And so we were watching Survivor this week and she said, you should go on Survivor, you'd totally win. I was like, I I would not be good at Survivor. And she's like, sure you would. I was like, how many skinny guys have ever won Survivor? Think about it. I don't have enough margin to start with. I'd have to eat for four weeks straight before going on that show. And so by not doing things that I'm bad at, it looks like I'm good at everything. And I make a world for myself where the truth is that I'm good for everything, good at everything. But the problem with that world is I'm the only one living in it. And that's the problem with moralism, is the world that that a moralist believes in is only their world because it is only truth for them. The other way not by definition or expectation to miss Christ in the gospel, is to miss the way that the Pharisees missed Christ. And that is through religion, legalism, obligation, moralism. Moralism or religion is the view that you are acceptable to God, to the world, to yourself, to whatever you care about, based on your attainments and based on you following all the rules. Moralism is seen outside of the church and following whatever rules someone believes is needed to be good or right. It is more prevalent in the church than relativism because it's really easy to slip into. Inside the church, it looks like religious activity, prayer, scripture reading, singing, not smoking or drinking, can all become moralism and rule following and obligation rather than de- devotion to Christ. Here, here, here's a way to check. If you do your quiet time so that you can post a picture of it to Facebook and Instagram, <laughs> instead of doing your quiet time out of devotion for God, then you are falling into the camp of moralism and religion. It's really easy for us because there, there are things that we are called to do as Christians And sometimes we don't want to do them, but we do them anyways out of obligation, right? And so somewhere in between the 
I'm good and God's going to forgive me of relativism and the, I'm just going to do everything that I'm supposed to do of moralism and legalism is the true Christian walk. And for me, balance is usually swinging from one to the other. I don't know about you. Maybe you sit in one more than the other. But both miss God. The Pharisees missed God through moralism and legalism. They were, they, they were known for preaching on the street corners and praying loudly at the temple for others to hear their prayers because they were doing it as a show for others. Their righteousness was done as a performance. Now, both of these missed the gospel. And while they seem different at their core, they are exactly the same because both of them at their core says, I do not need a Lord or a Savior because I am good on my own. The relativist says this because they define what is true and they are their own Lords and Savior because no one can tell them what is right or wrong or sin. The moralists do this by being their own saviors and lords through religion. God owes them because they are righteous and good because they have followed every rule in the book. The, the way the Pharisees set it up was there was, so the, the core of the law where you, if you break it, you're sinning. They added an extra layer of the law around it, almost like a hedge or a fence so that you could break that law without actually getting closer to the real law that would cause you to sin. Creating for themselves more work, more law, a bigger, heavier burden to carry. Both reject the need for a Savior to die for their sins because either they aren't sinners because it's not truth to them or they are not sinners because they have followed all the rules. And Jesus made it clear that both must come to him to see the Father. Both must come to him for salvation. And that's where we get to this word of invitation, this call to us in verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is one of the most profound examples of Christ calling people in the, in the Gospels. On several occasions, Christ calls people to come with him. When he calls the disciples, he says, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. But there's a different word here. It's not come with me. It is come to me. It is a word of invitation to come to him for rest. In Judaism, the, the idea of yoke was common, this, especially in this setting. They were an agrarian society. They understood yokes. They would yoke two, two oxen together to pull a plow. They also had yokes that people themselves would carry. It would be on their shoulders, and they would carry some type of material, possibly water. And so they knew what a yoke was, and they also knew what a yoke was in terms of observance and study of the law. It was often referred to as the yoke of the law, including the repetition of the Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4. Shema Israel, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Akkad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. They would repeat this over and over again because Deuteronomy says, write this on your heart, put it on your doorway. Remember that the Lord is your God and the Lord is one. And by repeating it over and over and over again, they created for themselves a yoke. And so the idea of yoke was one that everyone that Jesus was preaching to right here would understand. They understood it as a religious authority. Jesus' Jesus's call here is one to exchange yokes. Christ's yoke would have meant to submit to him as the religious authority. The yoke of the Pharisees was a heavy obligation of following rules. The yoke of Jesus was light. Christ's invitation here calls for radical change because what it says about us. It says that we bring weariness, we bring burdens, we bring tiredness and sin, and he gives us rest. That's the word that would have been Sabbath, which literally means to cease. You bring your burdens, you bring your tiredness, you bring your sin, and I will give you a cease to it. 
I will give you eternal peace and rest, eternal life. The gospel says that at just the right time when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Through his death and his resurrection, we are given his righteousness because he took our sin. Salvation is not by our works. The only thing that we bring as it comes to salvation is sin. Christ did it all, taking all our sin and giving us his life. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. We come weary and tired and broken, and he gives us rest and ceasing from sin and the punishment of sin. And this is simultaneously beautiful to us, and it's simultaneously offensive to us. Because throughout my life, I have been told you can do anything you want. I've been told of the value of my self-esteem and self-worth. But the truth of the matter is that's not what Christ has called us to do. It doesn't say, come to me, all you who can do everything. It doesn't say, come to me, all you with high self-esteem. It says, come to me, those of you who are weary and heavy burdened. Bring your sin. We don't like hearing that we're sinners. That's offensive to us. No, we're good. We don't, I don't need your help. I can do this on my own. The beauty is that we can never do it on our own well enough. And that's the problem. We can never clean ourselves up quite good enough. So in January, you guys know King Tut, the child pharaoh, they found his tomb with all these riches in it, yes? Yes, okay. Maybe you don't, I don't know. All right, so King Tut's mask, they were about to put it on display and so they started to clean it. And you know what happened? The long beard snapped off while they were cleaning it. And this is the, a beautiful metaphor for what happens when we try to clean ourselves up. Because when we try to clean ourselves up before God and make us worthy of his salvation, all we are doing is making ourselves more broken and more in need of his salvation that comes through Christ alone, not through our works. Salvation is by works, his, not ours. And while this is difficult for us to hear sometimes because it doesn't bring us self-esteem, it is what makes Christianity unique. Every world religion says you either have to do something or not do something to reach heaven or nirvana or whatever else. There's a list of things you either do or don't do, and it's all on you to do them. That's what every religion is about when you boil it down, except Christianity. Because Christianity says that humans are broken depraved people in need of a savior. And that's what makes Christianity beautiful because it's actually telling the truth about you and about me. We don't like that truth. We like to think, you know what? I can do this. Give me a list. Like, I love checklists. Let's go. I can, I can check off boxes all the time. That's not hard. Like, I can do this. But we never do it well enough. We always sin. We always hurt others. We always don't quite get it right. And Christianity is the one religion that says, you're not going to get it right, so come to Christ, because at the foot of the cross, all sinners are welcome, because Christ willingly came down to earth to reveal the Father to us, taking our sin and giving us rest. The gospel changes everything, because only in him do we find life and rest. So then what do we do with this? What do we do with this word where it's, don't, don't place too many expectations that aren't right about the Messiah and don't live in obligation? What are we supposed to do? The first is quite obvious. Come to him. If you have never made Christ your Lord and Savior, this is a call to you today as much as it was a call to them when Jesus said it. Come to him. Bring your weariness. Bring your brokenness. Bring your tiredness. To him, and he will give you rest because at the cross he paid the price. At just the right time, it says in Romans 5, while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Only in Christ is there rest from the tiredness of sin and the burden of religion. Jesus here demonstrates that he has the keys to heaven. He does not tell people that if they follow the teaching, they will learn the truth. 
or that if they follow him, he will show them how to get to God. He tells them he himself will give them salvation. So if you have never trusted in him, come to him today and receive rest. If you have come to him, then start living in that rest. Stop performing for God and for others in the church. Stop living in religion and start living in faith. Come to him, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. Get rid of the burden of religion that we place on ourselves and start following him. It's this weird paradox in, in the Christian life. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself so that no one can boast. It is a gift from God. For you are God's workmanship created in him to do good works. And it's like, Paul, what are you doing here? You said it's not by works, and then you say, do some work. So how do we work without it being religion? And the answer is we do it out of a response to who Christ is. We don't live the Christian life to feel better than others or to judge others. We do it because we know the one who has given us rest from our sin. Take his yoke. It's interesting, he doesn't say, come to me all your heavy burdened and tired and broken and I will give you rest so that you don't have to do anything. He, he then says, you will take my yoke, but it's a better yoke. And we must take that yoke as well. And that is that work aspect that is faithfulness. We work out of faithfulness and love of God. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to know exactly what to do because Jesus tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it's not always easy to know how to love God. It's sort of a nebulous concept. Like, God doesn't need a whole lot from me, and what exactly is an action of love towards God? Um, and C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says, here's what you do if you don't know how to love God. You ask yourself the question, if in this moment I loved God, what would I be doing right now? And then you do that thing that you'd be doing if you loved God, and that's how you learn how to love God. If you're wondering how am I supposed to be faithful to what God has called me to do, you ask yourself the question, if I was faithful to what I should be doing right now to God, what would I be doing? And you do that thing. And slowly you learn how to love God and be faithful to him. And you take this yoke that is easy and light because it's not about the actions you do earning your salvation. It's done in response to the rest that has already been given to us. So let us believe and follow the one who came and gave it all for us. Jesus shows us in this passage, it doesn't matter if we miss him through expectations and definition or out of religion and obligation, that all of us are called to come to him for rest. Rest from our sin, rest from our legalism, and to live in light of the gospel and of grace. As, as we wrap up, the band's going to come up and, and play, and we're going to take communion. And what communion is, is it is a confession that we believe Christ to be who he says he is. Because in it, we take the body and the blood of Christ, which Jesus says, eat my body, drink my blood, because there you will know me, there you will be saved. And so we, we remember him in this, we we trust him in this and we proclaim who he is. Now, communion is something that is for believers. So if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you are a member here or not, you are welcome to come to the table. And at each of these tables around here, there's going to be someone uh, who, who will serve you the communion. And then you can take it and go back to your seat and pray and, and take communion as we sing. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you have given us rest from religion and obligation, that you have given us rest from expectations that cannot be met. Help us to trust in you and to love you. Help us to find rest from the weariness of work. We thank you for your son who came and died for us and whose death we remember now as we take the Lord's Supper. I pray all these things in your Son's name and by the Spirit's power. Amen. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, 
singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him.